The red letters of the Bible are really the words of Jesus highlighted in red. Go to some of those old Bibles on the shelf and check it out. And if you read those red letters, you will find that what Jesus said 2,000 years ago was not only radical there and then, it's radical here and now. He's got much to say about the role of women. He's got much to say about race relations. He's got much to say about peace. He has much to say about the affluence of some and the poverty of others. If you're into red letter Christianity, if you want authentic Jesus lifestyle, you will want to watch Red Letter Christianity because that's what this show is endeavoring to present. Welcome to Red Letter Christianity, a, a program that's designed to challenge people, and especially young people, as to what it means to live out the red letters of the Bible. You know those Bibles that have the words of Jesus highlighted in red? Well, we're going to take those words seriously and try to figure out what that means, living out the words of Jesus in the 21st century. We have a great guest today. Shane, we have uh, Luis Cortez. Uh, he heads up a lot of Hispanic ministries in, in North Philadelphia, and for that matter, across the world. And, and he's become very, very famous as of late. Uh, when Time Magazine listed the 25 most prominent uh, evangelicals, he was listed there. You didn't make it. <laughs> I didn't make it. Luis Cortez made it. Yeah. And uh, he's doing some exceptional work there. Well, and, uh, you know, we try to have a diverse uh, group of guests, and I think how he diversifies, it's not because he's Latino, because we've had other Latino folks, but he wears a suit. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a real suit. A real suit. And, but, but, you know, uh, when, when I... Don't get me wrong. They say that Shane has, a, has an outfit to wear. A, he has a different suit for every day of the week. This is it. Yeah, this is <laughs> <laughs> For every day of the week. But, you know, I, I think that when I look at Scripture... Uh, there are, there are folks that are voices in the wilderness, like John the Baptist, he's crazy, you know, like eating locusts, wearing camel skin, and he, he's out as a, uh, there. But then there's Daniel, you know, in the, in the king's court. But he's careful that he's, he's in the king's court, but he's not drinking the king's Kool-Aid. You know, he like protects himself from the, the, the kind of temptations that are there and, 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 and his own integrity. And, and that's what I'm really excited to talk to Luis about because there's that scripture that says we need to be as shrewd as serpents but as innocent as doves. And it's, it's very easy to get entangled in the systems. He, nobody demonstrates this for me what you're talking about better than Luis. I mean, he's able to go and deal with um, Democratic presidents and uh, get support for the ministries for Hispanic people there. He's able to go to George Bush, get support from people there. Uh, he, he works both uh, sides of the aisle because he recognizes that the Jesus he has come to proclaim is neither a Democrat nor a Republican. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, he, he appeals to both sides of the political aisle. And if there's anybody that has been able to work within the system and make the system work, for the good of his people, the Hispanic community. I don't think anybody does it better than Luis Cordes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's got a video. You want to look at this yeah. thing? What is it like to grow up here? I mean, it's rough coming up as a kid because of all the drugs in the street. All this negativity around our neighborhood, the drugs, the fights. High dropout rates, functional literacy, kids can't read the daily news, which is written at the eighth grade level. You combine that with economic poverty and it's just not a good mix. At least 60% of the neighborhood is in, would be determined to be in poverty. Um, the schools in this area um, reflect that as well. We knew that um, the public schools in our city were failing our children, period. Um, that's, that's not an exaggeration, it's a fact. We want to create a new culture, an educational culture, an institutional culture. We started looking at doing a charter school because high school was the greatest need. High school is where we we're going to go. And that's when we created Esperanza. What we're seeing as we're looking you know, in the data is that Esperanza's achievement levels uh, are higher. Their retention and promotion rates are higher their graduation rates are higher. Today we're 20-something uh, million large with 200-something employees, an $8 million charter school that's probably the best uh, 
neighborhood high school in the city of Philadelphia and doing things with Latino students that nationally would be considered um, phenomenal. I found out about Esperanza Academy through my friends. Yamara Arroyo is a, a student here who started, and she was an ESL student, came from the Dominican Republic. It was pretty scary, not knowing a word of English. The gush just kind of goes around you. There's a crowd, but you, don't, you can't understand it. You can't connect with it. I was not very good at writing, but they pushed and they pushed and they pushed me. There was no such thing as a language barrier for her. She came in here working hard, learning the language. She picked it up. Within a matter of four years, she was given a full ride at University of Penn, and, and that is an amazing story. There's so many things I want to do in my life, man. I'll be honest with you. There's so many goals I have. Beautiful kid. He doesn't hold nothing against either one of us because none of us are perfect parents. You know, I told him I'm not, I'm not father of the year caliber. You know, I know he does love me. And I know he tries, he does his best. I never knew what Esperanza was, you know, until my son started participating, going in there, asking. He told me, you know, we're not accepting no one now. So I was a little discouraged. I was a little upset. And um, I went home, you know, I talked to my father, I'm like, Dad, Dad, you know, I want to I be in this school. And they were actually turning him down, and we were kind of depressed by it because a Spanish kid in a Spanish neighborhood couldn't go to a Spanish school. We really struggle with the fact that only 700 kids could come in, and we do it by lottery. We're not a private school, this is a public school. We're open to everybody, but we have waiting lists that are in the hundreds. And the reason why is, again, because this is a place where we teach our kids, we are committed to our kids, and the parents understand and appreciate that. And they, too, become partners uh, that make it for a successful educational environment. My mom introduced me to Esperanza. She attended Esperanza. She got her associates, so I saw her graduate, and I just seen the excitement and just how much she used to come home feeling filled with knowledge and just women empowerment just by going back to school. We all came here because we wanted to do something with our lives. How old were you when you decided to go back to college or go to college? I was in my 40s. It was my dream to gain an education, but I didn't have the opportunity when I was a younger person. You see that first A, you know, and then it's like you've never seen an A before, so you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I did that. You know, mm -hmm. I actually pushed myself. Many students will come here and their biggest motivation is they want to go back into the community and change their community in some kind of a way. So when they leave, this is on their mind. So you have a student who started an ambulance service because ambulances just weren't coming through here fast enough. Talk about what an education has meant to you. Oh, it's been phenomenal. I mean, it's. I, it, it opened so many doors and opened my mind to so many different things. I, uh, it just makes me look at life and, and the world a whole another way now. And I'm work, currently working on my master's degree and just keep going from there. I opened up my own business, I'm opening another own business. I started here at Norris Square Senior Center as a secretary. I got my associate's degree. Now I have my bachelor's degree and I run this place. What education does is to bring life, is to create paths for persons to be able to go toward those places of meaning, those places where they become, where they're empowered, where they discover the fullness of who they are. And that's what spirituality is. It's having the fullness of life and of who you are. And I'm grateful for everyone at Esperanza for what they have done because personally, me, myself, I don't think I could have made them go that far. I always try to tell them about the negativity in the world. What's out there? What's out there? What's out there to get you? What's out there to hurt you? And I guess Esperanza showing him the other side of the world. Je m'appelle Jomara Arrojo. Je suis un étudiant à l'Université de Pennsylvanie. Um, mon concentration, c'est la sociologie, avec un spécial concentration en les études en global et international. And I'm also a minor in French. We only save 700 kids here. That's our enrollment, 700 students. And still, thousands of kids are lost in our community. So we struggle. The work never gets done. It's always uphill. But there are, in fact, uh, challenges that await us that we don't even know yet. Is that right? It is. It is. Well, 
Were you impressed? Wow. Reverend Cortez, it's great to have you, brother. Great thank to be you. here. Thank you, guys, for having me out. Yeah, man. We're, we're, uh, we're actually neighbors, and, and, uh, and, and yet, like, I hear about what you're doing all the time outside the neighborhood and inside the neighborhood, so I have a ton of respect for, for what you're doing. One of the questions we were talking about was how you navigate uh, the, the small and the big worlds, you know? I mean, for, for us, uh, the simple way we say, we want to dream big but live small. Mm -hmm. and, and this is stuff that's really happening in real neighborhoods, and yet, like, you're a part of changing the conversation on a national and international scale, too. Well, uh, thank you, first, for, for having me. And part of what we've always done is respond to whatever God would bring before us. And so, uh, back in 82, because I think it's important to say nothing happens overnight and bricks have to be laid and you build the foundation and you keep building on it. So over a period of years, uh, from 82 to the present, which is a long time, much longer than I want to admit, but uh, over the period of time, we've managed to use the relationships that the church has. And the church is everywhere. And our brothers and sisters are everywhere. So it's about finding ways to connect the network that already exists and to have dialogue with the church. Mm -hmm. So at an international level, um, Prince Charles wants to figure out how do I start communicating more about the environment? And we end up in a dialogue which has us in his home and we have tea in England in his house. Mm. It's, it's just Lipton tea, man, it's no different. Yeah. But, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, out of that relationship, we're now doing a project with the Hispanic church in the United States. So you're right, if, if we build and if you work hard and you just trust in God that God's gonna open the doors and supply the resources, you just keep moving forward and, and you will grow. The, the, the imagery that we got on this video uh, was uh, quite astounding. Now, I know a lot about your work because I've followed you from when you just started out in 82. He's a graduate of Eastern University Seminary. Uh, uh, he's a graduate of our seminary, and you were there with a great Hispanic theologian, Orlando oh, Costas, who really got you going. I'm going to cite some of the things you're doing. Give me numbers, not the statistics mm -hmm. or everything. You got a, a bilingual community college. It's, so far as I know, the only one that exists in the nation. Right. It's an auxiliary of Eastern University. You are a branch campus. But you get all the credits of that university. How many students? 250. You got a high school uh, with high school students. How many students? 750. Elementary school? Not yet. We're Not working yet. on it. Okay. We're working on uh, it. You have Career Center. How Career many people center. go through that in a year? 2,000 women on public assistance. Is this amazing? Yeah. Uh, housing. Right? Housing. We have a housing. That's about what? 400 families. 400 families. Right. I mean, housing, education. Education's a big thing with you. That's obvious. Well, education is the only way to change our communities. Um, we look at it uh, in two fashions. Um, if you're Bill Gates, you can change society overnight with your wealth because you'll say, I, I always use something absurd, but it communicates. If I'm Bill Gates and I say, hey, I want to fund left-footed jumpers, and I'm going to give a million dollars to every, the, to the best left-footed jumper at every age, you know that every child in America, before he goes to school, mom and dad is going to say, son, put your books down for a minute. Get on your left foot, jump. And you know Nike will create the Just Jump Left-Footed sneaker, and Harvard, Princeton, and Yale will fight to fund the chair of left-footed yeah. jumping. We don't have that capacity, so we have to do it the old way, which is the way most ethnic groups in America have done it. You start by creating institutions, the institutions translate values, the institutions help you and get individuals to, to, to move into the mainstream of society, and then those institutions try to make them feel guilty and give money back. Give us, a, you, you have one success story up here, this young woman who Umada. went to the University of Pennsylvania. Could you give us one other little vignette of, uh, okay. of a young person who came through your program who is out doing great things for Jesus well, and for the kingdom. We had a young person from the community, came to our high school and graduated, did two years at our junior college, went to Arcadia. She now teaches at a uh, at the Spirit and Truth School in the community yeah. where um, she's working with uh, Manny Ortiz, for those who know Spirit and Truth Doing Fellowship. She's a teacher in his school. She's on our board of directors at the high school and the board of directors of Esperanza, and she's working on a master's degree. Mm. We have dozens of stories like that. And one of the things I'm really excited about being here today is to try to challenge Latinos who are listening 
to come and identify themselves as red letter Latinos mm -hmm. and then figure out how we can start working with them across the nation because I really feel we have something to to contribute both to the his, to the church to the Hispanic church to the church at large and to our communities. I mean it can be a little intimidating to hear your story you know Prince Charles meeting presidents and all these things like but what, what do you say to a 16 year old Latino kid that's going I want to do something to change what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in my neighborhood, what Six, happened to my 16 year olds is perfect. At 16 year old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior at a local Baptist church in, in Manhattan, Second Spanish Baptist Church, an American Baptist church. I accepted Christ and I said, I want to change the world. I haven't changed the world yet, but I'm working on it. And if you give yourself to God and you give yourself to Christ and you start focusing on changing misery to good, don't worry about it. The poor will, the poor and misery will always be with us, whether it's a wealthy individual who's suffering different kinds of pain, right? Spiritual pain or health pain or f pain because of individuals in his family or the poorest person in your block. There's always misery and we could always relieve that misery and provide the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. When you were a kid, you go through college, you go on to seminary uh, at, at Eastern and a very prominent, maybe one of the most prominent uh, evangelical theologians uh, in the world, a uh, leader in an varsity Christian fellowship, uh, a really great Christian leader, Orlando Costas. Right. You go to him and he gives you vision and puts wheels on your wagon and gets you going. Right. So here's a young kid who's Hispanic in San Diego and he says, who will do that for me? Well, I think if they come to Eastern, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll do a plug for my local school. If they come to Eastern, but there's a lot of Christian colleges that are networked. But not like your junior college not like ours. that is Hispanic. So if they come to our schools, we will find ways to network them in. If they send an email to me, I will try to help them find someone locally. I don't have that problem. We don't need to gather all of God's resources. But if you feel called and you want to teach in our schools or any of those things, just go on our website, esperanza.us, and send us an email, say, I saw you on Red Letter Christians. My name is so-and-so. This is what I hope I to do. I want to be a Red Letter Christian Hispanic uh, division, because we're going to start right. a Hispanic division of this because it's so important. Well, I think it'd I, be great. You know, I, I want you to, I want to hear more about uh, th this, this country, um, this experiment called America, you know, like it, it's changing pretty rapidly, our population. And I think part of what uh, a lot of other folks notice outside of this country is that, that the, the Latino population is, is growing really rapidly. Like white folks at some point are going to be a minority. We got to rethink, you know, Right. a lot of things and so what, what well what it's interesting like, right? it's interesting um we were contacted by the president of mexico who wanted to have a conversation about how to change uh the future dialogue on human trafficking and gun trafficking hmm. so i get a call and we get to go visit uh in los pinos which is their white house with the president of mexico and i said to him you know why are we why me and he said the hispanic church and hispanic people in general are going to be able to change American society in 15 years. It's the same statement and dialogue I had mm. with uh, Prince Charles. Uh, I haven't been able to have that dialogue with politicians yet. They don't want to hear it. Mm. But outside of the United States, there's a recognition of the demographics of our nation. And there's a recognition that, it, that the youth, Hispanic youth, and the majority, the, the median age of Latinos is under 22 years of age in this country. Mm. It's Hispanic youth who are going to be formulating our culture in the future. So not only do we need to look at it as an American investment to have these American Hispanics grow into, into the culture, but also externally we're being viewed as a, as a leadership for the country as we move forward. Uh, you know... Uh, that whole thing of raising up Hispanic leaders is crucial. And I hope that, I hope that some Hispanic young people who are watching this show take, take up this opportunity that you're saying, contact me and let's see if we can place you. I, because we really want to call these young men and women into ministry uh, for Christ in the kingdom. The school system of Philadelphia, uh, you're in Philadelphia. They are estimating by 2020 in the public school system, almost half of all the students will be Hispanic in origin. Uh, at Eastern, we're training missionaries to go to places like the Dominican Republic or Colombia or Argentina. 
as youth workers. We have a youth ministry major, and we're saying, you know what happens? We send people to start churches in third world countries, but we don't have any youth work for his. And your point is clear that the Hispanic population under the age of 25 is explosive. And we really have to start reaching them with Christ. And I hope that some of the young people who are listening to this hear your challenge and accept your challenge and start doing great things for and, God. And I think it's important that, that as our young people hear the, this message, that they grab that opportunity because the inverse happens, right? If our young people don't grab the opportunity, the Lord will just call somebody else. And we're going to see missionaries, young people, missionaries from Latin America, coming here to do the ministry. We already have missionaries from Colombia and Argentina coming and Brazil yeah. coming to the United States to work in Hispanic communities because we don't produce enough ministers of our own. Yeah. So that will continue. It hasn't happened with our youth yet. And our youth happen to be English dominant. So there's a lot of opportunity there for, for ministry in a way that's new, innovative, and that will literally change our country in a positive way as we move forward. I want to just switch gears a little bit. As you you uh, you haven't run for office. <laughs> but, no interest, my but, man. But, no, no interest. So my my question is is uh, like the the especially young folks the, the satisfaction with the political candidates as is, is at an all time low. I mean, I think yesterday what was it was eighty six percent of uh, folks in the United States are unsatisfied happy, with yeah. the Congress. And it has an eleven percent. Yeah. Approval rating right now, 11 percent. So, so I mean, the tendency might be just to to drop out, you know, to be like, I don't, I don't think that that, that does any good, you know. But but you've you've continued to engage. But I think you've had, um, you you've had a, a a good way of hoping for like not everything to change through right. politicians, but maybe they can do something. Talk, talk a little bit and, about and that. immigration, yeah. particularly. What are the right. politicians going to do we, on that? We've done a lot of work on immigration. We're doing some things on um, machine gun control trying to control machine guns at the border. Oh uh, we're doing things on human trafficking. We're called to, we're, as Christians, we're called to run the, the race. Mm. We don't decide who wins the race. We don't decide if we get to win the race. We're told we're in a marathon, and we're told to run it. So whenever you find evil, you fight it. You fight it, you fight it, you fight it. You don't worry about winning or losing. You just fight it. Mm. The winning and the losing is up to Christ. And in the end, we know we win. Mm -hmm. So fight. And that's the attitude that we try to give our staff and that we, we try to, to, to firm it in our churches because sometimes our churches feel like, wow, I only got a, a pastor says, man, I can't get a mega church. Everybody wants to have a mega church. I can't get a mega church. I got 200 people, 150 people. Oh, and it's a tough neighborhood. And, my, you know, when we have these dialogues with our pastors, what we tell them is don't worry about it. That is your fight. Fight the good fight. When we talked about all the stuff that Esperanza is doing, they spun off uh, and made independently a health clinic that runs several thousand yeah. people through. Right, you know, Esperanza the, Health Clinic. You know, it's it's also in the neighborhood. That's and where I go when I get sick. That's yeah. okay, yeah. all right. So you know, you know yeah. the place. And, and you have the Hispanic clergy. You're trying to do something right. for the clergy of uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia and or in Hispanic. The, and who, in the country. We, we, run, we work with 13,000. Hispanic congregations in the U.S., which allows us to have the dialogue without getting usurped in a, the political dialogue. Yeah. Because if it's just you, then both parties will say either you're with me or you're not. And if you're not with me, they won't have a dialogue with you. Mm. But if you can garner enough of a relationship and a network, it's a different conversation. Mm. So we've had meetings with politicians where we'll have 15 or 20 pastors yep. sitting with that politician and they represent 20,000 or 30,000 members of their churches, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different conversation when, when a guy from Philly is sitting with 20 pastors who are his constituents who total 20,000 members. Yeah. It's time to wrap yeah. this show up because we could go on talking about the great work among the Hispanic community of this nation, but maybe folks, you want to... can uh, find out a little bit more information on the website, right? Yes, it's, it's www.esperanza, which is E-S-P-E-R-A-N-Z-A dot U-S. You're an inspiration, man. It's Thank great, you. Great, Thank great you, guys. Great Young you. people, consider ministry in the Hispanic community and get in touch. You're watching Red Letter Christianity, and we just had an incredible conversation with Reverend Luis Cortez. As I heard him,
sharing, one of the scriptures that came to my mind is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers. And rulers in high places. Yeah, and, and that those, those are, we can see them in our neighborhoods, you know, but we can also see them kind of entangled throughout all of the, the systems and structures of government and of institutions that are out there. But uh, Reverend Cortez was saying, we got to keep fighting though. We got to we got to fight those those systems. But realize that there's people that are entangled in those. And and I love the fact that he has met with everybody from Prince Charles to the president of Mexico, and and, and is looking not for what we we don't have in common, but do we is there any place where these things might align with the values of Jesus and the yeah. kingdom of God? And if there's any little window of that, we're going to work together. When we had a Democratic uh, governor in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, Rendell, he loved the work he's do that Luis is doing and supported it financially with grants from the state. The Republican governor comes in just as thrilled with working with Luis Cortez. I mean, he's been able to navigate the system brilliantly and without becoming partisan, but at the same time understanding that politics is not to be walked away from. Yeah. It can be used for the work of the kingdom of God. We need young men and women who not only go into Hispanic ministry, but say, maybe I have a role for Jesus Christ in the political system. Yeah. I mean, uh, we have a low rating. What did you give the other day? It was, it was uh, USA Today. It said 86% of Americans disapprove of Congress right oh, now. And only 11% approve of it. Yeah, that, the not, rest are undecided. <laughs> you know, but, 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 you know, I, I think that... We need Christians raises, going into Congress. We need Christians into every sector of society uh, affecting change. It, it raises the question uh, that, uh, of where we put our hope, doesn't yeah. it? Because I, I remember when Obama was uh, elected and, and running for president, uh, all over our neighborhood there were signs that had his picture and it said hope under it. And yet there's something in us that should really be suspicious of that because as Christians we hope a little differently not in one person as a messianic hope of the world but we found our hope in Jesus and we're going to work with anybody that's going to move us yeah. closer to the values of Jesus. And you you got to come to my church when my pastor preaches because when he preaches on hope I can hear him ending the service by saying my hope is built on nothing, nothing less, less than, than Jesus', Jesus blood, blood and righteousness. righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strain, but wholly lean on Jesus. And name. all other ground is sinking sand. Yeah. And there's a lot of sinking Christ sand. Is a solid you know, from rock. Wall Street to Congress. Christ so is we, a solid rock. Yeah. Well, um, guys like Luis inspire me more than I can tell you because he's learned that you don't have to be countercultural. You can be cultural. Christ works in all kinds of ways. Thank you for watching Red Letter Christians today. Red Letter Christianity is about Jesus. Thank you for listening, and I hope you're with us next time.